And if you would, if you have a Bible with you, turn with me to Ecclesiastes 6 and 7. Ecclesiastes 6 and 7, as we continue our study through this interesting, sometimes perplexing book. On Thursday this past week, as I was beginning in earnest my sermon prep for this morning's message, and I was wrestling with Ecclesiastes 7 quite a bit. I came across this in one of my books on Ecclesiastes, a a book which, by the way, uh, is usually among the most helpful that I have on Ecclesiastes. It's by Sidney Gradanus. He wrote this about our passage for today. This is one of those passages that sets preachers to pacing in their studies, wringing their hands. What does it mean? How do we preach it? The temptation will be great to either skip over it or preach on just a few verses. And then he quotes another scholar who said, It is hard to be satisfied with any commentary on this section. It is very hard to understand. And I didn't know whether to be encouraged or uh, further frightful at the rest of my preparation. But I, but I did realize that I had my introduction. There's my introduction, I thought. I'll quote Gradanus, and perhaps the church will have some sympathy on the rest of the sermon. Well, more than that, uh, the difficulty of Ecclesiastes 7, and attested by the best of the scholars alongside the need for me to say something more than this is a hard passage, so let's pray and go home, it got me thinking along these lines. There are things that you and I know, and there are things that we don't know. There are things we don't know and can learn. There are things that we cannot learn, things that we will never learn in this life. Just like there are things which we can control and those things which we can't control. One agenda item for this interesting book of Ecclesiastes with its investigation of life is along these lines about what we can know, what we can learn, what we must learn, and then what we should change, but also what can't be known and how to live with what can't be known and what can't be changed. To paraphrase an earlier section of Ecclesiastes, there is a time to ask questions and a time to shut up. There is a time to learn and a time to let be. There is a time to meditate hard on life and God and eternity and a time to accept mystery. Well, today we'll look at the last few verses of Ecclesiastes 6 and the whole of Ecclesiastes 7. Let me start by reading to chapter 7, verse 14. We'll stop there, and then we'll read the rest of the chapter later on after we've given some time to ponder the section that I'm going to read now. So look in your Bibles, chapter 6, verse 10. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry. 
for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God, who can make straight what he has made crooked. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. Well, again, we'll stop there for now. Ecclesiastes is a bit of a roller coaster. The author takes us through various ups and downs, frustrations, futility, and then fulfillment. Or we could say it's like a musician that's writing a, a great musical score, most of, what, most of which is in the minor key, the dark notes. And occasionally his piece finds a major key, the happy notes. We can just quickly review the few happy notes that we found already in the book of Ecclesiastes. Thumb back to chapter 2, verse 24. You might want to just circle this verse or put happy in your margin or something like that. There are several of these. We've seen three thus far. Chapter 2, verse 24, eat, drink, work, and enjoy what God has given. And then chapter 3, verse 22 there's nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. And then chapter 5, verse 18 in following. Eat, drink, and find enjoyment in all your toil. This is a gift from God. Well, at the end of chapter 6, we're already back in a minor key. Applying the last few verses of chapter 6 to our lives, we can word it this way. We should consider these bitter problems. Consider these bitter problems. I'll just state it up front that these problems are really not that big of a problem, especially if we wrestle with them. They're not that big of a problem for the Christian who has their heart right and their thinking caps on. But the preacher is presenting these as universal problems with all of their heartache. These are dilemmas. These are predicaments. And let me like make clear, if I haven't already, how important this note is, this minor key, regarding the structure of Ecclesiastes, which you may have noticed already, which I implied already this morning. It's not a clear, clean line of progression and development. Ecclesiastes doesn't give us a, a straight line from the problems of life or the questions about life to simply the answers. No, there have been questions or dilemmas, but then conclusions, and you turn the page or simply look at the next verse, and oftentimes the same old problems are staring you in the face again. We all would like the tidy, logical progression of, say, the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, where he has a few chapters on sin, and then a few chapters on grace, and then a few chapters unpacking a theology of Christian growth, and then he gets into specifics later on. Many Christians are used to the idea in the New Testament that some things are indicative, they describe what is, what we have. And then there are other things that are what we should do. They are imperatives. And we would like that kind of clean distinction perhaps here. But God didn't write Ecclesiastes like that. He didn't give us that kind of book here. And maybe another reason why Ecclesiastes goes round and round like it does, it's not just because it's Hebrew wisdom literature, unlike say, the Apostle Paul's writing in Romans, but maybe it goes round and round like it does, because isn't life like that? I mean, do you ever settle things, never to return to them again with other questions? 
Don't you sometimes come back to the same questions and the same dilemmas and the same mysteries, even though at one time in the past you settled it, you studied it, you worked through it. But new circumstances arise, new emotions are found in your heart, and you find yourself going back to that old friend, asking the same questions again. Wait, how does that work? What about this? What about these verses? For example, the sovereignty of God, which is in verse 10. Whatever has come to be has already been named. It's already been declared. It's, it's been decreed by God. Hopefully you've already done a bit of thinking about God's sovereignty. Hopefully you already know what the scriptures say about it. And by the way, you can know what God's word says about his sovereignty and control of all things. You should know, you must know what God has said in his word about that. But rare is the Christian who doesn't occasionally come back to questions asked years ago. If God is sovereign, am I responsible for my decisions? If God is sovereign, what's the point of it all? If God is sovereign, why pray? And that's what the writer of Ecclesiastes moves on to next in verse 10. Man is not able to dispute with one stronger than he, referring to God. Verse 11, the more words, the more vanity. Many might here today find some comfort in the fact that this wise man of old, this preacher of Ecclesiastes, the teacher, even he wrestled with God's sovereignty more than once. In verse 12, he's wrestling with what is good. You see that? What is good in these short lives that we have, proving that he's not a fatalist when it comes to God's sovereignty, he wonders, what are we supposed to do? What is the good life? It could be translated, what is better? Which will become relevant for chapter 7, which we'll see in just a minute. He's saying, our days are short. There are a lot of decisions to make. Sometimes there are two good things. Which one is better? He asks another question in verse 12. What will come after? Or what will happen next? Aren't these common questions? If God is sovereign, why pray? What are we supposed to do in this life? What's the better thing? How do we know what will happen next? Well, in chapter 7, he'll give us some answers. Warning, they may not be satisfying to you at first. They may not even be sensible to you at first. Nevertheless, they are wisdom. It is God's wisdom. So secondly, learn the better Proverbs. You could put better in quotes if you'd like in your notes, if you're taking any. These are better Proverbs. Note first that these are Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs are not just found in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs are sayings of wisdom on how to live well. These in Ecclesiastes 7 are not better Proverbs in that they're better than the book of Proverbs, but that they have this word better strung throughout. They contrast two things and then tell us which of those is better. And again, the wisdom is counterintuitive. It's certainly countercultural. We can summarize these better proverbs under four subheadings. Like burials are better than births. Verses 1 and 2. A good name, you see that in verse 1? I think that means a good name at your funeral. Is better than luxurious oils. While you're alive. Expensive, luxurious oils. Those aren't as good as a good name at your funeral. The day of death is better than the day of birth. Now this is sometimes taken by Bible teachers to, to take in the full biblical sense of these words. Which would incorporate Maybe teachings from Philippians 1 where Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To be with the Lord is very much better. And hence, they say, that's how the day of death is better than a day of birth. 
Well, that's true in Philippians 1. It's probably not true in Ecclesiastes. You see, you read on in verse 2, and it's better to go to the house of mourning. This is about those who go to funerals, not those for whom the funeral is for. For this is the end of all mankind, death, and the living will lay it to heart. He's talking about lessons that we observe from other people's death. Burials are better than births because they teach, and they teach powerfully. Where do you learn more about life and God and yourself and sin and the curse and eternity? At a kid's birthday party or at a funeral? It's at a funeral, isn't it? You know that. The birthday party may be louder, but the funeral speaks the loudest. There, there's a unique moment of clarity. We don't like to admit that, but we know that. We know that deep down. Funerals tell us powerfully we're all going to die. A few people in this world morbidly obsess about their own death, but most of us, especially when young, do our darndest to not think about our death. We don't like to think that there's some cosmic clock counting it down. Well, Ecclesiastes says not only go to the funeral, not only remember the person for whom the funeral is for, but think of your own. Think of your dying day. Charles Spurgeon, that great Baptist pastor, he said, we can shut our ears to the voice of God in mirth, that is in celebration, but in the house of mourning we can hear every whisper. It is better to hear of him in this house of mourning The noise of the happy song drowns the still, small voice of God. But in the house of mourning, you can hear every footfall, even the voice of time, the ticking of the clock, which says, now, now, now. This is why churches used to have cemeteries on their land, not just to bury uh, their dead congregants, but also to teach They're living congregants. And they would be taught by reminder every time they walked into church through a cemetery. They would be reminded, we're we're going to die. This life is short. The curse is real. We must be right with God. Then there are tears that are better than laughs in verses 3 and 4. Sorrow is better than than laughter. Now, we're right at some point about now to be scratching our heads. After all, chapter 5, verse 18 and following said, this is it, this is life. Eat, drink, work hard, be happy, enjoy it all. This is a gift of God. And now here there's this minor key almost saying the complete opposite. But it's also true. This is also true. This is the same Bible, the same book. And it says sorrow is better than laughter. And we know that. How do we grow? Do we grow by giggles and jokes? Or do we grow by pruning and pain? When are things most clear, most acute? When are we most aware of what is most important? When do we pray more? When do we pray better? When is it that we feel most needy for God and most dependent on him? It's in days of sorrow, not in days of ease and celebration. There's so many places in the New Testament that speak like this. I think of 2 Corinthians 1 where Paul says, We were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. 
And he comes back to a similar theme in chapter 12 of the same letter. I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Why? So that the power of Christ might rest upon me. I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for when I'm weak. Then I'm strong. Then we see rebukes are better than pop songs. They're better than pop songs. That's a paraphrase. But it's pretty close to what verse 5 says. It's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise men than to hear the song of fools. You see, this is all in the same vein, isn't it? It's all very counterintuitive. It is definitely countercultural. And it is, at, at times, counter your comfort, at least your temporary comforts. But we know it's true. It is better to hear the rebuke of a trusted friend than it is for us to go on in our sin and our stupidity and pretending that we're not as we just turn up the Taylor Swift song all the louder to drown out the guilt. No one likes to be corrected, but we know we need it. Eternity needs to be seen as on the line when it comes to our sin. The rebuke of a good friend is sometimes exactly what we need for our, our souls, not just for our actions or our conduct. We need to keep thinking about what is best eternally, not just what is best immediately. And then verses 7 to 10 tell us that acceptance is better than, well, the alternatives. The word alternatives isn't mentioned in verses 7 to 10. Neither is the word acceptance. But, but that's what you have here. You have alternatives to acceptance being denounced. You see, acceptance is better than corruption, according to verse 7. Oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. When some people lack money or they think they lack money, they think they need more or deserve more, they might turn toward some form of corruption, either bribery or oppression. But there's a better way. Accept what you have. Trust what God has given you today, for today. Acceptance is better than impatience, verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. Don't respond to your present circumstances with impatience as if your impatience could speed things up any. That's presumption and pride. Acceptance is better than anger, verse 9. Don't be quick to become angry. It lodges in your heart. Don't respond to circumstances or to people either with a hot temper or with a slow-cooked bitterness. These go into the heart, and they don't come out easily. Acceptance is better than nostalgia, verse 10. Don't say, why were the former days better than these? Don't live life looking in the rearview mirror, but in the now. It's easy to think that some yesteryear was easier, better, funner, more pleasant. Well, it probably wasn't. That's the way nostalgia works, right? But even if it was, Ecclesiastes says, it's not from wisdom that you ask this. So accept what God has for you now, what he has for you today. Accept this day as his today for you. It's from him. So let's just review a bit before we move on. God is undisputedly sovereign. Life is short. So we should ask, what's good? What's better in this life? Well, here are some things that are better. Burials are better than births, and tears are better than laughs, and rebukes are better than pop songs. And acceptance with God and his plan is better than any of the alternatives like Corruption and impatience and anger and nostalgia. 
Now, this has been in the weeds, hasn't it? These are very particular things, funerals and tears and pop songs and business dealings and memories. Now, the writer of Ecclesiastes will pull back a bit. He says, thirdly, apply these big principles. Verses 11 to 14 of chapter 7. Apply these big principles. Principles, not in the weeds of the specifics like business dealings and and certain songs or the crackling of fire under the pot. Apply these big principles that wisdom is good, verse 11. Wisdom is good. It helps out. It actually works. It's like an inheritance. There's an advantage. There's protection with wisdom, verse 12. But verse 13, wisdom is limited. It is not sovereign. Our wisdom, as great as it could ever get by any one of us, it is not omnipotent. Consider the work of God, it says. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? God alone is sovereign and omnipotent, and it is his plan. And it's not ours. We're not God. Verse 14 In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. So here is wisdom. It's not only the recognition that God is sovereign, though that's included. It's not only that God is sovereign and his ways are inscrutable. As Daniel 4 says, He does whatever he wants, and none can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Wisdom is not only the awareness that God's plan for us will include some mysterious, unknown mixture of blessings and adversity, but it's also the kind of wisdom that knows what to do in each of those. So it's real simple. In the day of prosperity, be joyful to the glory of God. In the day of adversity, consider, contemplate. Contemplate that it comes from the same God who gave you the good stuff. It's the same God. He hasn't changed. Consider in days of adversity. And now fourthly and lastly, know the biggest problem, the biggest problem, verses 15 to the end of the chapter. Now I began this message by quoting Sidney Gradanus, remember that? He said something like, this is one of those passages that sets preachers to pacing and wringing their hands. He says there's great temptation to skip over it and it's hard to understand What I didn't tell you yet is that he was writing that specifically for the verses we have remaining, verse 15 to 29. He thought those were very, very hard. And at first I agreed. After studying them some more with the help of others and prayer, I think this section isn't that complicated after all. I think it can be simplified And I'll just tell you how it can be simplified before I read it so you can watch for it as I read it. I think verses 15 to 29 of Ecclesiastes 7 deal with the biggest problem, which really is twofold. It's universal death, that everyone dies, and universal sin. Everyone sins. We're all sinners. So let's read it. Chapter 7, verse 15. In my vain life, I've seen everything. There's a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that strength, And from that, withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Wisdom gives strength to the wise more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. 
Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. All this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? I turn my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things, which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all those I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Let's start with universal death. The righteous and the wicked all go to the same place. They have the same destiny. And there's no guarantee that righteous living will last longer than unrighteous living. Sometimes that is true. And Proverbs actually talks about that. That there is um, an expediency to the grave for foolish living by and large. But not always so. According to this passage, sometimes the wicked prolong their life. So, be not overly righteous, it says in verse 16. A shocking statement, I know. It seems contrary to the whole of Scripture. Why would we not be overly righteous? Well, this may be referring to fake righteousness, like the Pharisees had in the New Testament. Or it may simply be speaking to that previous issue. Righteous living doesn't necessarily get you any more years on this earth. So don't be righteous in order to get more years as if you could. And of course, don't live wickedly or like a fool. That's not the remedy to anything. Then he moves to this bigger problem, bigger than universal death, is universal sin. Wisdom is one thing, verse 19, it gives strength, it makes a wise man stronger than ten rulers, but, verse 20, surely there's not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Not the most wise man ever. And then he proves this universal sin with the example of gossip. Verse 21 and 22. Don't take to heart all that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. That sounds like just sage and practical advice. Don't go out of your way to hear what people say because you might overhear them talking about you. God knows you've done it to others. Well, that is wise. That's good advice. But it's not just wise. I think it's proving that that broader point of universal sinfulness. Your heart knows that we're all sinners because you can feel it when someone gossips behind your back and it condemns you because you've done the same to others. Sinfulness affects our minds, our reason, our sense of things. And so here's a guy who has set his whole life to pursue wisdom, to try to figure out what life was about, to try to get the most out of it he can. And he's come to some conclusions, and he's, and he's made some observations, but there's still frustration. Verse 23, I said I'll be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? He has learned some things indeed, but there's much he doesn't know. God hasn't revealed everything, and sin has blocked much. 
One thing he has learned, verse 26, you see that? I found something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. This is like that Proverbs woman. She's in chapter 5 and I think 6 and 7, at least 7 of Proverbs. There she's the personification of temptation and foolishness. She's like a, a temptress looking to seduce a man. That's what foolishness is like and what temptation is like. And, and she's here as well. He who pleases God escapes her, it says here. But the sinner is taken by her. Now this looks like a simple warning, just like we would find in the book of Proverbs. Watch out for seducing women or any kind of foolishness, not just sedu seductive women. But we see a broader point if we keep working our way through. You see, verse 28, my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. What has he not found? Well, someone who pleases God and escapes temptation, verse 26. So he's not found one like that. Well, verse 28, one man among a thousand I have found. But a woman among all these I have not found. I noticed no one said amen after that, and I'm thankful for that. It is God's word, but we have to understand it. And that's not normally something that the Bible says. I mean, should we write this guy off as a misogynist? Or worse, buy into his misogyny and conclude that all women are seductive temptresses, that one out of a thousand men is righteous, but there are no righteous women. That needs explanation. And we need to understand how Hebrew wisdom literature works in order to understand what this means. You see, in Hebrew wisdom literature, there's often overstatement, Sometimes there's an oversimplification in order to, to, to word something poetically or in a picturesque way. There's often symbolism in this literature. And there's often a progression. You take Hebrew poetry and one line states something. The next line will most likely state the same thing but add one more element to it. And that's the full picture. Well, in this case then, it would go something like this. Let me just paraphrase what we've already read. It's as if the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying here, I tell you what I've seen over and over again in my years. It's something more bitter than death. Seduction and temptation come. There's a fork in the road. The one being tempted can either please God or be taken into sin. And here's what I've seen repeatedly. One out of a thousand guys gives in to sin. 99.9% .9 of the time, they give in to sin. And I haven't seen any righteous women either. None are righteous. No, not one. That's the point. It's not a point about gender. It's ratcheting up. It's using examples. One example, 99.9% .9 of men are sinners. Why don't you go ahead and round that up? It's 100%. And no woman is righteous. No, not one. You see verse 29. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright in the beginning. But they, they have all. They have sought out many schemes. You see the progression? Men are sinners. Women are sinners. Everyone is a sinner. It's a poetic way of wording what the Apostle Paul takes three chapters to say in the book of Romans. Romans 1, the Gentiles are sinners. Romans 2, the Jews are sinners. Romans 3, everyone is a sinner. He says there, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. 
So Ecclesiastes 7 insists that something of the foundation of wisdom is to know what the biggest problem is. The biggest problem is not your lack of control in this world. Your biggest problem is not your lack of money or possessions. The biggest problem in this world is not the cumulative sadness. It's not your fear of the unknown. It's not even corruption or anger or pride. Those are symptomatic of the biggest problem or examples of the biggest problem, but they're not the biggest problem by themselves. It's not even death, though that's getting much closer to the answer. The biggest problem in this world is still sin. We die because we sin. The wages or payment of sin is death. God made man upright. But they have all sought out many schemes. And now there is, verse 20, no righteous man on the earth who does good and never sins. Now you have to know what sin is. You have to understand that sin isn't the breaking of some arbitrary, culturally conceived code of conduct. Sin is seeking out many schemes on our own, apart from God. Sin is going away from him. We were born in that direction, and then we just willfully keep on going unless he intervenes. Sin is doing our own thing. I did it my way, says the song. Sin is an attitude or action or affection or allegiance that is not God. It's a substitute God. Everything must be for him and toward him and with him. Romans says whatever is not of faith is sin. So sin isn't just the really bad stuff. It's not just the rule breaking. It's doing anything good without God in it. It's simply cutting him out of our lives as if we could. We have to get that right before we ever begin to think about the true meaning of life or living life well or having life that's better. We gotta get that right. Ecclesiastes 7 doesn't tell us exactly how. Here we are at the end of Ecclesiastes 7. We're still in a minor key. Ecclesiastes 7 doesn't give us the answer, but it helps us fully understand the problem. And that's good. We need that too. You, you'll never understand your need for the medicine unless you first are convinced that you have the disease. And you've got to get the disease and the medicine matched up. If I said you have measles, therefore chemo, you would think I'm not really a doctor. You'd be right. You've got to get it right. Or else you'll never see your need. You'll never see what the rest of the Bible communicates to us. Like this in Romans 3. I've already been reading from Romans 3. So let me just pick up there. The good news doesn't come in Ecclesiastes 7, but it sure does in Romans 3. Now the righteousness of God has been manifested. Apart from the law, apart from doing, apart from rule keeping. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to this righteousness of God that's been manifested. The righteousness of God through faith, through belief, through trust. In Jesus Christ, for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, that is, declared righteous by God's grace as a gift 
through the redemption, the payment, the ransom that is in Christ Jesus. And I'll tell you what, if you've been swimming in Ecclesiastes for a little bit, getting back to the Apostle Paul is a little shock, isn't it? My, that's wordy, you might say. And it is, and it is gloriously so. If you don't know why Jesus came to this earth as God in the flesh, lived righteously and died on a cross like he did, I'd encourage you just to read over those verses I just read again and again and again and again. If you know another Christian, maybe you can ask him what some words mean or even look it up in, in the back of a Bible if you have that. We've sinned. We've fallen short of God's glory. But in Jesus Christ, you can be justified, declared righteous by his grace. Not, not anything you do. It's simply through faith. It's by believing. This is a gift. You, you just simply confess to God that you're a sinner. And you know you're in trouble. But you believe that Jesus is enough. That he's done enough. That there is redemption or ransom or payment in him. Ecclesiastes 7 talked about one out of a thousand being righteous. And that's hyperbole, right? It's, it's not even accurate. There isn't one out of a thousand men who are righteous. There's none righteous. No, not one. But what if there was one righteous? What if he had so much righteousness that he had some to give to you? What if he was so gracious and kind that he would pay for all your sins, all of them? Well, friend, that's the gospel. That's the good news. That's the story of the whole Bible. That is the making of a Christian. I wonder if any in this room today have actually just experienced that. You wonder, maybe, maybe you still have some questions, but you think, I think I'm ready to do this. And I'd love to talk with you after the service. I'd love to just know that you are there. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to answer any questions you might have. Christian, there are some things you cannot know. You cannot know whether tomorrow will have adversity or prosperity. Don't try to guess. Trust him. Trust him for today's today. There are some things you can't know, like when you'll die. You don't know when you'll die. Don't bother yourself with things you can't know. But there are some things you can know. You can know that you're going to die. You can know why you die. Because sin is in this world. The wages of sin is death. You can know the one who died in your place. You can know about him, about his glorious plan, about everything that he has spoken to us in this word. And that transforms life. That all of a sudden funerals are more real than they used to be. And also more hopeful than they ever were. Well, let's pray for God's help. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We praise you for your kindness to us in your word with all of its many varieties. We thank you that the minor key so loudly noted in Ecclesiastes finds, well, some resolve in our Savior Jesus who is righteous for us, who is our wisdom, who points us in a path where we don't simply trust in ourselves, we lean on him and we love him. Lord, we thank you for these truths. We thank you for your word. We pray as we sing now about you being our rock and our redeemer, that you would give us faith and joy in believing, enough that would sustain us for days ahead, which no doubt 
will have some prosperity and adversity, but we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.